Welcome to our new series of yearly budget PC builds, Budgetorama. And since Intel in its wisdom decided to sunset Celeron's name for arguably worse nomenclature, we opted to see how well this Budget Champion line's members performed throughout the years. It's well known that as years passed, the gap between Celeron and higher-end CPUs widened. Let's start with the youngest one we have. And see, does it put up a fight? We'll start with the obvious choice, our Intel Celeron G1820. It's a two-core, no hyper-threading processor, the weakest and the cheapest from the Haswell generation, which is also known as 4000 Gen. The naming scheme is already a bit out of whack for Intel in 2014. Other, higher-end parts from this generation have proven over and over that they're excellent performers, and they might be the peak of 2010's Intel outing. As for our Celeron, it's been cut to hell and back. Hopefully, it performs somewhat better than what the specs indicate. At 53W TDP, this Celeron will not be difficult to cool down, so we'll use the 1150X aluminium-only Intel stock cooler. We also bring you some changes to our video format, as we'll discuss per part performance after the benchmarks. There, we'll also discuss possible alternatives for our components. Buying a good and affordable motherboard in 2014 was not only possible, but also an easy task. We opted for Asus H97ME, one pretty good socket 1150 motherboard. As its name says, it utilizes an Intel H97 chipset, which does everything that Z97 does, but without overclocking options. With its minimal price and negligent price difference compared to the lower specs chipset boards, it simply didn't make any sense to buy anything else. We have two of these, and both of them were sporting i3-4870s in a stable system for many years. For memory, we've decided on 2x4GB 1600MHz memory sticks from Gale. There is a lot of room for upgrades here, but enhancing PCs is not in our focus for budget builds. 8GB of total memory should fulfill our needs nicely for this one. The ace up our sleeve for this PC is quite predictably the graphics card. You might have seen this NVIDIA GeForce GTX 750 from Asus used as an upgrade in a bunch of our previous videos. It's nothing to write home about with its feeble 1GB of video memory and 128-bit memory bus, but its price-performance ratio was excellent, and that's all that matters. It was a go-to upgrade for a long time, now is its turn to shine. For storage, we'll use this Gigabyte 120GB SSD. It is equivalent to the SSD we would purchase in 2014. Even then, we'd prefer the performance and stability of an SSD, instead of the larger capacity of an HDD. To compensate for the lack of storage room for newer games, we'll also add another 480GB SSD. For case and power, we will use our newest Testbench prototype, an SFX Be Quiet 600W PSU. We do have some period authentic power supplies, but sadly they can hardly be considered reliable. Here's the list of parts we use in this PC build. We've added MSRP or price estimation during the corresponding year. It's time to build this machine.
And now, when the machine is built and fully working, let's go to benchmarks. We'll start the benchmark breakdown with the Tomb Raider game from the year prior. The game is perfectly playable up to the ultimate preset, where performance is just passable. Compared with the GTX 750 performance with a more powerful test bench, it's the same, so here we are observing the GTX 750 limits. The only outlier is the low preset, where we are heavily bottlenecked by the Celeron. In the Talos principle from 2014, performance is good on all presets. Even on Ultra, where it's achieving stable 25 to 30 FPS. Already a year later with Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt, we venture deeply into the unplayable territory. If you don't mind occasional stutter and disastrous load times, you could go on to play it on the low preset. In 2016 Doom, our CPU choice barely matters, as the full weight of the performance is on our GPU. And it shows, as we get decent performance even on higher presets. Shadow of the Tomb Raider can be played on the lowest preset on this machine, even without upscaling. Once again, we are limited by our graphics card, which is unfit to run this demanding game at higher quality. Interestingly enough, Counter-Strike 2 works. And pretty decently at that. We toyed around with upscaling techniques, but couldn't discern any performance gain. Our CPU didn't limit us much in our gaming endeavors but its limits were painfully obvious elsewhere. Celeron as a brand lost a lot over the years, going from a good budget alternative to the bottom of the barrel. This one did put up a fight, but considering that the latest ones were still dual core and similar performance, it's all downhill from here. A good alternative would be something from the Haswell Pentium lineup, or even better, a Haswell i3. We're quite happy with our motherboard choice. It easily fulfilled our high expectations. It's also a pretty good basis for further upgrades, if you would venture that way. With a drop in i5 or i7 and a better graphics card placed in its PCIe 3.0 slot, this motherboard can achieve much more. GTX 750 was a good GPU in its time, especially considering its affordable price. Its largest limiting factor is its underwhelming amount of memory. Historically, it was overshadowed by the GeForce GTX 750 Ti, which is also a good alternative for a bit meatier budget. In total, the build was not bad. Its longevity was propelled by the stagnation of the CPUs on the market, and you could play quite some demanding games on at least low quality. We'll definitely go further in the past to seek Celeron champions. See you around.